everyone. I think we would like to get started with the program tonight. Uh, before we do, could you just take a moment to silent, silence your phone? Thanks very much. So I'm Susan LaPerla, the Director of Public Services at the Ferguson Library, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's Civility Series Lecture. Those of you who have been to one of these programs before know that in partnership with the Dylan Schneider Group and Hearst Media, we bring you speakers from fields ranging from aquarium husbandry <laughs> to running a sports media network. These experts are here to tell us why civility is important in their work and crucial to their success. Tonight, we welcome Jean Detell, author of Reckoning with Race, America's Failure. And here to introduce our speaker is Bob Berkowitz from the Dylan Schneider Group. Thank you, Susan. Good evening, everybody. And thank you so much for coming and braving a bad forecast outside. We're always being urged to have a frank and open conversation about one of the most pervasive and difficult topics in our country, race. And honestly, we rarely do. We rarely have those kinds of frank and open discussions. Well, tonight, I hope our speaker will be the catalyst for that important dialogue. Jean Dow grew up in the Mississippi Delta, where the majority of the population was African American. He went on to earn his undergraduate degree at Yale and studied law at Vanderbilt University. Jean had a successful career in the world of international finance, where he worked in London, Hong Kong, Tokyo, and here in the United States. Now, much of his passion and life focus has been on race relations in our country. In 2009, Gene wrote the book, Cotton and Race in the Making of America. And most recently, he authored Reckoning with Race, America's Failure. He has been an advisor to both the New York Historical Society and the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. Please welcome Mr. Gene Daddle. <laughs> Thanks, Bob, and um, thank you for coming and braving this weather, as Bob indicated. Um, the topic tonight is civility and race. Um, civility as we once knew it had a universal set of norms, respect, courtesy, etiquette, manners, listening, and questioning. These were the formats for our social discussions and our debates. These fostered an openness and a directness and frankness whether people agreed or disagreed. And sometimes they changed their mind and sometimes they didn't. Now there's an academic attack on uh, civility, this universal set of norms. And universal norms by, and it's creeping into colleges, by these academics is now considered white informed civility. Um, facts and well-considered arguments have been superseded by subjective experience. So why would someone write a book on the hardest of all hard topics in America, race? And this book is uh, part personal and part intellectual. Um, I grew up in a small Delta town of 1,500 people, Ruleville. And my family were part of the uh, quintessential Jewish trade. Uh, they were dry goods. Uh, we had dry goods stores. And I worked in those stores from the time I was a teenager. And you could see in these areas, this was in 1951, and the stores were, were all integrated. In the back here, you see most of the black customers. These were, that's the immigrant. And uh, you learn civility by being in sales in a store like this. And being in a small town, you also learn how to navigate between old, young, middle class, poor, and white, and black. I would walk out the door of the store, walk around the corner, and uh, stopped into the Chinese grocery stores and then the juke joint where there was blaring uh, blues music. The second formative experience that I wanted to talk about was my going to Yale in 1962. And I happened to enter Yale when James Meredith integrated the University of Mississippi. Um, so I was the center of attention, more like a target than a center of attention. Um, and uh, the people asked questions, they criticized me, etc. So that was the beginning 
That was the beginning of a lifelong interest in racial history, economic history, and colonial uh, nationalism. And I was helped by some terrific professors there. The, the third experience that I want to dwell on is my 11 years in Hong Kong and Japan. For there I was a racial minority, a very small racial minority uh, in, in Tokyo. And Tokyo and Japan is a homogeneous hierarchical uh, society. It is completely different from our multi-ethnic uh, we are the grand experiment in a multi-ethnic society. And this was the 1980s, uh, when everybody thought that Japan was going to take over the world. Well, what was interesting about it was this was the first non-white, non-Western nation to challenge the U.S. economically. And I learned firsthand what the, what the, uh, what the sig significance is in terms of positive and negative features in terms of a very obsessively a homogeneous society. When I came back uh, to the States, I became very involved with um, race again, primarily in Mississippi, but also up here. I started uh, reading programs in the schools in, in Mississippi. I gave fellowships uh, to people to study um, race in terms of the towns in some of the deltas. I would always pair a black student and a white student. And also, I did a parallel lives program for eight years, from Harlem uh, to uh, the Alabama Shakespeare Festival in Montgomery. And for the new book, uh, <clears throat> Reckoning with Race, I'll be doing various uh, programs with prominent African Americans who, who will do an, a parallel lives plus a discussion of the book. Now, this all led to cotton and race. And we are juxtaposed between Martin Luther King Jr. Day and Black History Month. So we need to pay um, some deference to, to history. And rather than white informed civility, what I want to talk about is history informed civility because it's incumbent. It's an obligation of both races to understand American history and their own history. All discussions about race at some point end up with slavery. And part of this, what I want to talk about tonight is the neglected story. And this is a storyline that uh, has distorted our American history, and we need to correct this. And I do this with, in Cotton and Race, and also with uh, Reckoning with Race. And that is the story of the abolitionist what they, we know what they thought about slavery, but what did they think about race? And here we're going to find some harsh attitudes. Cotton and race was a real shocker in many ways because the white abolitionists were, for the most part, anti-black. The biggest fear of the white north was a black migration north. The best guide for understanding what happened to emancipation to, the, to bl the black experience after emancipation was the antebellum North. Because, as we remember, the North won the Civil War. The South was utterly defeated. I also wanted to go local, so there'll be a lot of Connecticut in this. And let's start with the Constitutional Convention that summer in 1787, when the Founding Fathers were presented with a very difficult question, a, con a nation with slavery or no nation without slavery. And the compromise was brokered between two delegates from Connecticut, Oliver Ellsworth and Roger Sherman. And what they thought, they were both anti-slavery to the core, and what they thought was that slavery would wither uh, and it would have become extinct very quickly. So may, they made this big bet in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of slavery, that it would it would end because slavery was was an economic institution. If it had no economic basis, it would die. And here, what we see is what happened: the economic tornado called cotton. This is a photo of New Orleans, the New Orleans Harbor, in 1860, and it looks like Shanghai uh, or Singapore or Hong Kong today. That's how significant it was. Cotton was the leading export in America from 1803 to 1937. Nothing will ever, ever take, uh, take that uh, 
uh, position again. S slavery would have withered without, uh, without cotton. And cotton, slave produced cotton was the proximate cause of the Civil War. You can't separate the two. The price of a slave directly correlated with the price of cotton. Slavery only expanded where you could grow cotton. And thirdly, 65% to 70% of all people enslaved, race-based slavery, uh, were directly or indirectly involved with cotton uh, production. No one would have taken the South seriously without cotton. The South wouldn't have taken itself seriously without cotton. And what was this South strategy at this point? Uh, it was completely based on cotton. So um, again, back to one of the major points that I think is a defining part of American history, what the anti-slavery people thought about black people. And here is a, um, a black abolitionist named Samuel, the Reverend Samuel R. Ward. And it's very clear what he thought about it. White abolitionists best love uh, the colored person at a distance. And we, let's come to Connecticut. In, in 1800, in 1784, Connecticut uh, had a, started its gradual emancipation process. In 1800, there was a survey. And the Article 27 of that survey asked whether a person born enslaved or born free, a black person, um, was more industrious or, or more moral if they had been born free than born in a slave. And each town ship in Connecticut came back with uh, a scathing report. Here's Timothy Dwight's report. Uh, he was the president of Yale, so he did the New Haven uh, report. Free blacks are generally neither able nor inclined to make their freedom a blessing to themselves. They have no economy and waste, of course, much of what they earn. They have little knowledge either of morals or religion. They are left, therefore, as miserable victims of sloth, poverty, ignorance, and vice. So what happened within a couple years in Connecticut? Connecticut disenfranchised its 2% black population. Why would you disenfranchise 2% of the people? And it also started a colonization society uh, to encourage blacks uh, to leave the country. This is foreboding, because what would happen if you had more than a handful of people. Uh, if you had a large percentage of blacks, you were going to have a huge, huge problem. Uh, Connecticut also voted against the 15th Amendment, and, as did New York State. Who is one of the, the citizens of Connecticut who are you most proud of? Harriet Beecher Stowe. I'm sure that most of you have been to the Harriet Beecher Stowe House in Hartford, as I have. What did Harriet Beecher Stowe do with the heroes and heroines of Uncle Tom's cabin. Any volunteers? She sent them to Africa. She was part of the colonization uh, movement. In, she wasn't part of the colonization movement, but she subscribed to, to its, uh, its tenets. Frederick Douglass, one of my four giants of black history, retorted, Madam, we are here, and we are here to stay. In 1854, when Frederick Douglass asked Harriet Beecher Stowe to contribute to a school in Washington, an industrial school for black men, she turned him down. Later in her correspondence, she said, when will they ever learn to walk? When will they ever learn to walk? Now, what did Harriet Beecher Stowe do after the Civil War, as many uh, Union soldiers? Uh, she funded her son and a couple of his Union Army buddies' cotton farm in, uh, in Florida. And she went down there hoping to make a fortune and to live there forever and ever. Um, and of course, most of these, these people went, went broke. They all went broke, actually, because cotton is a very roller coaster uh, um, economy. You don't want me to start talking about that. Um, now, is anyone here from Indiana, Ohio, or Illinois? OK. They had black exclusion laws. 
In other words, a black person could not enter the state. In 1862, by a five to one majority, uh, Illinois voted to keep its prohibition in terms of black, <coughs> black suffrage. Do you know how many, how many black people lived in Illinois at the time? Not, not 1%. 0.1% of the population. Again, why would you want to do that? And uh, this moved further west. The Wilmot Proviso, which we were, we were taught in school, was essentially the prohibition of slavery west of the Mississippi. It wasn't just the prohibition against slavery. It was the prohibition he didn't want free blacks to move west either. This was <clears throat> basically incorporated in the Oregon State Constitution of 1857, which had a black exclusion law. No free black or mulatto not resi residing in this state at the time of its adoption of this constitution shall come reside or even actually stay within the state. Um, do you know how many people um, Oregon had? Oregon had 52,000 people um, at this point in 1857. It had 100 black people, and yet it had an exclusion law. That exclusion law was, it wasn't enforced, but it stayed on the books till 1926. During the Civil War, and I won't go into battles or anything, but um, what happened during the Civil War was there were black former slaves behind Union lines. They were refugees. And at two, there were two attempts in September of 1862 to send them north. One was to, to Massachusetts, where the governor, John Andrew, said, no, we don't want them. They'll end up as paupers. He was one of the heroes of the movie Glory, if you've seen that. The second place that they were sent uh, was also was in Illinois, <coughs> race riots. Uh, broke out immediately. Um, so what you've got here before the end of the war is, I think, a fair statement of what's going to happen after the Civil War. This is the New York Times, February 25th, 1865. We must get cotton back into production. And that means white ingenuity and enterprise ought to direct black labor. But this next part is very interesting. The Negro race would exist side by side with the white for centuries, being constantly elevated by it. Individuals of it raising to a level of equality with the superior race. Now, there was always, and this is something when we have longer period I'll talk about, there was always room in the white psyche for a black elite. So the North won the Civil War. The South was utterly devastated. For most of Reconstruction, former General Grant was the president, eight years. Uh, he was not squeamish about battle or losing men, and yet he did not send troops uh, into areas, particularly uh, when there was voter suppression in 1875. Later on, he said that he was, it was too politically sensitive. He would lose Ohio if he'd sent troops into Vicksburg in 1875. So the hero of the Battle of Vicksburg in 1863 was also lost the Battle of Vicksburg uh, in, uh, in 1875. Um, from what we understand uh, about the lack of will in terms of Reconstruction, Reconstruction was dead on arrival. There was no way that white Northerners were going to shed white Southern blood for black rights. What emerged from this is, is something very, very significant, what I call a containment policy. And that is uh, blacks were directly and indirectly uh, contained in the American South uh, to be farm laborers. And the result was that between 1865 in 1914, uh, there was no black migration north. The black migration of the north stayed under 2%, and it only changed with another economic event. As you probably gathered, I can generally find an economic event for virtually everything that we, we talk about in history. What is with that event? It was World War I. Industry booms, no white immigration, and unemployment goes down. During this period, 18 million, 18 million white immigrants 
came into this country. So there were no black people moving north, but 18 white Im million white immigrants. When I ask an advanced placement uh, class in high school, what would have happened if the north had been racially tolerant, the students invariably say um, there would have been a labor shortage and white southerners would have had to acquiesce to black rights. During this containment policy, there was only one attempt to go north. That was the Exoduster movement from the Deep South into Kansas. Kansas said, no, we don't want them. Uh, it stopped very, very quickly. Um, what happened in terms of those 18 million uh, white immigrants that came in? This is Detroit. Detroit, in this period from 1910 to 1960, was the boom town in America because of the automobile industry. So many of these immigrants from, from Eastern Europe who were peasants and, f and functionally illiterate, didn't speak English, were greeted <clears throat> with schools by most of, the, uh, most of the, um, the major Detroit companies. 300 companies had English language schools. This is actually a graduation. I found this in a brochure from Ford Motor Company. <clears throat> what happened to black people? As soon as they moved north, race riots broke out across the north. The biggest one was in Chicago in July 1919 when the city was under martial law for four days and scores of people were killed. This is the memorial. There was no memorial for that event, which was enormous in American history, and there are no memorials for many of these events uh, that, than there should be. And this was, was um, instigated in, uh, by a high school group in 2009 in, in Chicago. Um, after the Brown decision, which was one of the seminal events in American history, which ended overt legal segregation, uh, we still had to confront uh, something that is still with us today, which is the de facto uh, segregation in the school system. And this was really prevalent in the North um, as well as in the South. And I wanted to deal with New York as an example of this. In New York, there were committees on integration virtually every time there was a race riot in New York in 1935, 1943, and also after the Brown decision because there was no way to integrate the New York school system. Um, and by 1966, New York had virtually given up uh, trying to integrate the school system. In 1970, the litigators f um, for the NAACP in the Brown case actually wanted model black schools. They knew it couldn't be, uh, it couldn't be accomplished uh, in terms of, oops, there is, before I get to the, the boycott, I found this is very interesting because of what happened, what's happening in Chicago. Uh, this is Richard Wright in 1937, and one of the reasons why Richard Wright left was because of the reality of gang murders, corrupt politics, and the Depression. Like most Americans seeking a broader vision of life, I packed my suitcase and struck out for other parts. This was reprinted in Ebony Magazine in, 19, in 1951. He didn't find that sanctuary in New York, and he ended up in Paris, didn't find it there. He actually tried to leave Paris to go to London, uh, where he couldn't get um, a passport. Uh, in 1964, just to show you how dramatic this was, this is New York. And um, in 1964, uh, there, were, there was a boycott of the New York school system because uh, they were underfunded and 445,000 black and Hispanic kids uh, actually left the school system. The pivot for race in America was, of course, the 1960s and the civil rights movement. Uh, in some ways, it was a pivot. We know that after civil rights 64, uh, there were riots in New York, Rochester, New York, and Philadelphia and four towns in in New Jersey. In 1965, of course, that's with the first of the big Watts riots. Um, and th I thought it'd be interesting, and it's something I use as <clears throat> a, a teaching, uh, teaching method, is to compare the civil rights leaders of the 1960s to those of today. And let's look briefly at two of the giants. One is Martin Luther King. And what he thought about, uh, this was in 1965, when the thrust changes from desegregation to integration, one of the black persons 
chief responsibilities is to prepare himself to live in an integrated society. We must face up honestly to our own shortcomings. And this next one is Whitney Young. Whitney Young was the executive director of the National Urban League. And um, very, very similar. Uh, Negro student, citizens must redouble their efforts to educate and train themselves for the new responsibilities. They must march not only to the picket lines, but to the libraries. They must prepare themselves for the stiffening competition of a no holds barred marketplace. They must make a special effort to eradicate the disorganization which has afflicted the lives of so many families. What was Connecticut doing during this period? The most progressive governor in America in the 1960s was senator from Connecticut and cabinet member was Abraham Ribicoff. He was John Kennedy's uh, favorite governor. At one point in 1969, he actually supported an, an amendment that was uh, instigated by Senator John Stennis of Mississippi, which said you can't integrate the South unless you integrate the North. And here's what Ribicoff wrote in 1972. The North is as guilty of monumental hypocrisy as in its treatment of the black man. Without question, northern communities have been as systematic and as consistent as southern communities in denying the black man and his children the opportunities that exist for, for white people. Um, next uh, event, which I deal with at length in the book, is Chef versus O'Neill, 1989. State court in, um, in Connecticut ruled that uh, the Hartford schools were, de were, were segregated. We have been dealing with that in Connecticut uh, since 1989 and with various, various ratios of people uh, who are supposed to be uh, creating um, a, uh, a valid ratio uh, of blacks to white students. It hasn't been solved. And then ju in, in 2016, uh, Judge Thomas uh, Mukawasher, am I pronouncing his name right? Anyway, anyway, he criticized he criticized viciously uh, the st state of Connecticut's educational system, and he quoted the head of the Board of Education of Bridgeport, who had said that many of the high school graduates of Bridgeport's public school system uh, were functionally illiterate. So. Back to civility and race. And I, of course, am a major proponent of the universal um, norms. And I think that racial separation, whether, whenever it's created, whether in 1800 or in 2018, is an obstacle to civility and an imperative of an open and frank discussion. One of the things I wanted to mention in terms of different perspectives, and I think this um, illustrates an experience that one of my old professors had, one of the radical professors of the 1960s, Staunton Lim. And he taught at Spelman College, one of the elite uh, black historically, uh, historically black colleges and universities in 1962 and 1963. In his um, survey course in American history, he started out in 1962 with the Plymouth, Plymouth Rock and the Pilgrims. Young women's hand go up. What has that got to do with us? So the next year, he changed his curriculum, and he started with the Amstead um, slave revolt on, on, on the ship. In the next class, hands go up. Young women say, why are you treating us differently? So here you have this identity uh, situation in full bloom, where are you a separate do you want a separate history, or do you want something uh, that's, that's this similar? Now, what do we have in common? Of course, with, with the pilgrims, uh, what we have in common is a common Western heritage. We have the Declaration of Independence. Uh, we have the Bill of Rights. We have the Constitution. We have the Federalist Papers. And I, I think what I'd like to, to dwell on and what we need to dwell on more is what we have in common as opposed to what, what separates us. And that, a lot of that is Western civilization. And to give you an example, when Martin Luther King 
was interviewed by Alex Haley, the author of Roots, um, for Playboy magazine. It was a long article. Uh, Haley asked him, uh, one, of the, one of the questions that he asked him was, other than the Bible, what is your favorite book? And Martin Luther King said, Plato's Republic. And I have found in two paragraphs in one of his speeches that, that King actually referred to St. Augustine, he referred uh, to Shakespeare, Edgar Allan Poe, and the Roman poet Ovid. Uh, so this is something we have in common. In order to have civility, there needs to be some form of familiarity. And at this point, it's very, very difficult. The best time for, to, to gain this interaction is, I think, in college, uh, where there are no, um, there's no residential uh, segregation and there's no need for busing, et cetera. Um, in my 50th reunion at Yale, something that, that resonated with me in terms of familiarity came up. And it was at a, um, a lecture by a psychologist on unconscious bias. And the man was going through various uh, slides of uh, demonstrating what he thought was, was unconscious bias. So I stopped him when he got to the, the white doctor and the black patient. And I said, was this the first visit? And he said, yes. And he was motoring along for more slides. And I raised my hand again and I said, what happened after subsequent visits? He said, the lack of trust dissipated. Uh, so I think that's something that we need to, uh, to bear in mind. Familiarity, contact is significant. And civility is best employed in a discussion, human being to human being, one on one. There's no need for an institutional crutch like uh, a group, a government, a school administrator, or a conflict resolution specialist. Let me give you an example. Um, a friend of mine, Lee Daniels, who was um, one of the handful of African-American students at Harvard in the 1960s. This is not Lee Daniels, the producer. This is Lee Daniels, who, who, who was um, the communications director for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, as well as later uh, the National Urban League. And he and uh, three of his um, classmates, African-Americans, uh, journeyed to Great Barrington, Massachusetts, for a commemoration of W.B. Du Bois. This is 1969. And they were standing there, and a young white guy came up. He was in his early 20s. And he said, what do you people call yourself now? Now, in 1969, this could have been dangerous. You would have gotten a tongue lashing or worse. So they looked at each other, and Lee, who's a master at this, explained to him the difference and why the, the, the names were changed in terms of each being devalued by the white population. So he started off with the African, then colored, then Negro, and then uh, Af uh, Afro-American. Now, you may think this is petty. This was, uh, was an, a major issue. Ebony Magazine in 1969 had a whole issue devoted to this. They did a poll and thousands of, of the black subscribers re responded, what do you want to be called? And are there any, any guesses? Um, I'll give you the answer. The, oh. Now, the, the, the largest segment um, was Afro-American. The next segment, that was 48%. 23% wanted to be called black. Only 11% wanted to be called African-American. And 8% wanted to be called uh, Negro. Uh, the next is a very interesting example that happened very, uh, very recently in Collierville, Tennessee, which is uh, a town in, in the east part of Memphis, Tennessee. Um, there was an episode in August of this year, of past year, 2017. Um, two white uh, teenagers, they were 13 and 14 years old, wrote a uh, racial slur on a black minister's car. And um, it was caught on, on security cameras, so they were immediately apprehended. Uh, so the question was what to do. And there was no street demonstration, et cetera. The mayor of the town, a man named Stan Joyner, and the black minister, um, Dr. Jason Mitchell, got together. They had a town hall, and they discussed things. And um, 
it, it brought about a realization that there needed to be more of this. Now, a couple of months ago, I called the office. I didn't. I had a contact who knew the mayor, called the office of uh, Mayor Stan Jorner and asked if I could speak to him and the Reverend. And he said no. It was too sensitive. So we, we begin to see how sensitive race is that this, which I, I thought was a real uh, teaching moment, uh, could have been translated to other places. They didn't want to do it. Um, the other example that I want to use uh, is something, I, and I think I would actually recommend that you, you, you look at this. Um, there was a debate, very acrimonious debate, between Robert Brustein, who was the dean of the Yale uh, Drama School, and uh, the black playwright, August Wilson, and I hope that you saw Fences recently, which was a phenomenal a movie, and uh, both Denzel Washington and Viola Davis were, were just superb. Um, August Wilson was a separatist. He did not want black people to play white parts. He did not want white people to play black parts. He did not want uh, black playwrights to, white, to write plays about white people, and vice versa. Um, Robert Brustein, and this was very acrimonious, and Devere Smith was the moderator, and he said, he said, uh, August, uh, you think you are a 300-year-old man walking around the slave quarters. Things have changed. And then uh, Brustein said, I am an individual first, I'm an American second, I'm a member of a group third. Um, so I, I would look at this to get these points of view as a fairly recent uh, debate in terms, of, in terms of separatism. The other the other example I want to use is something that happened to me over the weekend. Um, there, uh, there was an article in the New Yorker um, called Hard Times, a Historically Black University in the Age of Trump. And it was written by Jelani Cobb, who's a staff writer for the New Yorker and, as many of you know, taught at UConn uh, for, for a while. And uh, what there was a protest at um, Howard University, which is his school, which basically um, it, it was against the president, Frederick, um, for attending the HBCU meeting with uh, Donald Trump. Um, and most of the article dealt with the fundraising, fundraising needs of, um, of the HBCUs uh, and, uh, and Howard. And I wrote a letter uh, to the New Yorker um, on Sunday. And what I said was that clearly the HBCUs had played a critical role and should be honored for it. Uh, but, what, but what Jelani Cobb did not mention was the rate of alumni giving donations at the HBCUs. And the, probably the leading clearinghouse for where I get a lot of my, my um, uh, indications of research is the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education. And the title in July of 2017 of one of their articles was The Sorry State of HBCU Giving. At Howard, it's 9.9%. At Morehouse, it's 11%. Respectively, um, of course, Spillman had 39%. So I think that um, it would have been a much more compelling story if there was some personal responsibility in terms of, of Jelani Cobb mentioning that and, 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 and um, fostering a better uh, alumni giving rate among uh, the people uh, because of their racial pride, because of their loyal and loyalty, and because of their gratitude. Um, one of the other things um, that I think has changed is a shift from race to values. And again, I want to bring up an example. Stephen Cohen, who represent, is a white guy, who represents the 9th district, uh, congressional district in Memphis. Uh, it's a majority black district. He's been elected there over and over again. He votes completely in tandem with the Black Caucus, who refuses to let him join the Black Caucus. Now, in terms of this, this, the, the civility basis of a conversation, um, there are sensitive topics, and with this, uh, this ground, the ground rules of civility, you can have them, whether it's on single parent uh, families, whether it's on poverty or income inequality, which is what I write about a lot, or uh, the criminal justice system, or memorials. And the memorials uh, it could be a very deeply interesting, uh, complex 
uh, complex topics, and we need to look at one of the things I mentioned in an article that I just wrote recently, we need more memorials for black America. But also, what this lapses into is the Confederacy and slavery, and then white supremacy. And there are candidates, particularly in New York, statues of um, Seward, Theodore Roosevelt, and Gandhi. Gandhi may surprise you, uh, but Gandhi's statue was removed from the University of Ghana uh, last year. And the reason was Gandhi, Gandhi, for his entire life, thought that black people were inferior to Indians. And as I said, in one of the real tragedies uh, that I see is going on in universities is, is that there, is, there could be a lot more interaction. I see uh, separatism in terms of what I consider hypersensitivity, in terms of microaggressions. I think you work these things out for the most part one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I think that cultural centers are fine. They have a place in ethnic cultural centers that have a, fly, have a place in universities. They should not be the center of, of a person's college experience. And to show how much things have changed, we'll go back to the Mississippi Delta, uh, which is the most southern place on earth. And um, it was the place where the Black Power Movement actually started. It was actually the place, Greenwood, Mississippi, uh, where Stokely Carmichael, and I can talk a lot about Stokely Carmichael, who, as you know, did not get along uh, with Martin Luther King, but uh, it's a very interesting story. It dissipated. He, he was the head, at one point, of uh, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and um, there was a pretty imperious group. They actually kicked out Fannie Lou Hamer from my own hometown, the populist black woman leader, because she didn't have a high school education. Um, and I think that, to some extent, the oops, Black Lives Matter uh, tends to, uh, to try to mimic uh, the Black Power Movement. And we can talk about Black Lives Matter. Um, I have a lot to say about that later. But what I wanted to get to, that was 1966 in terms of Black Power. This is Greenwood, Mississippi today. The same town uh, that Black Power started. Uh, this, this is June 2017, and this is a, a mayoral election. Uh, Greenwood is 75% black. Uh, the small woman, the diminutive woman in, in front there is uh, Carolyn McAdams. Uh, there are eight members of the city council there, um, uh, six of whom are black. Um, Carolyn's ad ran with these people there, there are seven of the eight there, and the, the caption read, uh, United. So is racial civility possible within a separatist society? I, I, have, I have my doubts. I think we need to look at what we have in common as opposed to what separates us, and I think civility in terms of conversations and debate about race is, uh, is one of the... the um, uh, the significant ways that we can do this. I want to close on a friend of mine's comments. Uh, as a black minister in Mississippi named uh, Edward Thomas, and we talk a lot about race. And once I ask uh, Reverend Thomas, um, would it make any difference if I spoke to a black kid or if he did? And he said, Gene, there are things that I can tell him that you can't and the things that you can tell them that I can't. And I think I want to leave on that note and um, ask for uh, some questions. Are there any questions? Sure. Black Wall Street. Black. Black Wall Street, oh, yeah. Oklahoma, and you know it was separate, and they were booming and they were doing extremely well, and they were forced to create their own economy based on what was going on. Do you think that, and then I, I know in Florida there were a number of places that were like Black Wall Street. Do you think that it was ever possible for it to happen where blacks would be able to establish wealth without the fear of being murdered, bombed, et cetera? Um, probably not before the 1960s. But that's, that is a great question, and that's, that's one that I deal with a lot, both in cotton and race and here. I don't think it's possible. Um, one of the goals 
of um, reckoning with race is how to get a mass of black people into the economic mainstream. And I don't think that's possible uh, in a separate society. And the example that you said is one, the, the major uh, early 20th century example was Mount Bio, Mississippi. Um, there, it's virtually impossible uh, to have your own separate economy within an economy. And, and just to let you know where we are, the numbers are really bad in terms of economics and education. And they started before Trump. The, my number's in in two, 2016. And um, uh, in the last 30 years, regardless of um, administration, the black poverty rate is three times that of the white pro poverty rate stays that way. The black middle class is a very fragile asset base. Uh, black personal wealth, the asset base, uh, is white uh, middle class asset base grows three times um, as, as fast as the black uh, middle class uh, asset base. The, one of the really startling statistics is um, that of all businesses that have paid employees in America, blacks own only 2%. And one of these things that, I'm, uh, that is very interesting, it's interesting to talk, and this is back to the Booker T. Washington, Frederick Douglass model, or uh, the Du Bois model. Um, what you've got, the two separate issues, poverty, which is the underclass, and uh, racial uh, income inequality, which is another issue. And the racial income inequality is baked into the system now. Georgetown does a study in terms of what black college kids major in. And 40% of it is, um, in, is in community activism or social service. Um, there are only seven, between five and 7% that major in computer science, engineering, finance, uh, or business. And in terms of healthcare, it's always the administrative part. Uh, it's not STEM or anything that's high paying. So. College majors uh, at this point in times are at this point in time are baking in a system of inequality, and I think that needs to be addressed. Uh, you know, and that's where the energy should be put. And that's I think we get sidetracked and and distracted in terms of other things. That's what I would like to see happen. I have another question. If no one else has one, yeah. Um, and if it's too sensitive, it's okay if you don't answer. Um, Recently, um, well, during football season, there was a situation where a kid from Wilton uh, was chanting to the black kids at West Hill High School and calling them the N-word. Which high school? Uh, West Hill High School and the kid from Wilton. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Are these the in Stanford? Wilton, yeah, the kid from Wilton High School was calling the kids from West Hill High School, which is here in Stanford, the N-word. And then last week, you guys all probably saw in the news, where they had to stop the Trinity games because a fight broke out. And the same thing happened where you had a white kid yelling the N-word to, and you know, things just erupted. And I'm loving everything that you're saying because you're right on target with the little bit of study and I have done. What would you suggest be done to eradicate this because eventually someone's gonna get hurt? Yeah, I mean, this, this is basically, uh, doesn't fit into my cap category of hypersensitivity. Um, and I think that what needs to be done is um, there has to be, if these kids can be identified, there has to be one-on-one -on -one, um, meetings. It can't be done with somebody lecturing about, uh, about oppression. It has to be done where these kids uh, get to know each other. And are these schools fully integrated or not? I think I think basically that it should be broken down into into sections within the school, and 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 let the kids discuss it among themselves. Henry, I have sort of a corollary here. I have sort of a corollary here. I was on the uh, board of a local community center here, the Yearwood Center, for those of you in Stanford, for about ten years. As was this lady who was just talking. We served together. And I was, uh, I was always asking the unpolitic question because I'm a white kid from Greenwich, Connecticut originally, and so I had a lot to learn. 
And um, at one point, we were trying to get, Yearwood was really running an after-school uh, babysitting service where they, they would help the kids with their homework and keep them off the streets until their parents got home from work. And we were having trouble filling the slots, even though the, the, the cost to the parents was mi very, very minimal. So I put my hand up and I said, well, you know, what's the problem here? Here's a solution to a problem and nobody wants to take advantage to it. And I was told by a number of the board members who were African American that uh, the kids saw education as a white man's thing and didn't want anything to do with it. Now, if that's accurate, we got a big problem. There, there is this this feeling in some quarters of acting white, for sure. Back to your question, I think one of the things that um, in high schools, um, familiarity. Once this contact, and there, we virtually separated each other in terms of of schools and um, in terms of residential housing. The tragedy is it does the one place that it doesn't have to happen happen to have to happen is at the university level and that's where uh, that's where I'm concerned I, I think small groups can be handled in, in high school um, in terms of in terms of the the acting white thing uh, it's been written about it exists why does it exist um, the um, I think the building blocks of society um, essentially before education are family community and religious in uh, a church and I think uh, I think without those education is going to be heavily burdened in terms of the issues that, that we see I don't see the black church uh, or the white churches doing enough not just on Black History Month uh, but actually uh, uh, talking to congregants um, about these issues one more question, and Gene will be around. You can okay. ask them afterwards, and also he'll sign books for you too. So. Okay. Uh, your last slide, uh, something in effect, we can't really have a discussion about race in a separatist society. That uh, the gist of that screen. C civility. It, what? No, we can't have civility. Can't it's very civility. difficult okay. because of the familiarity thing. Okay. Uh, is it perhaps we're separatists because maybe people like me and most of us are unconsciously racist? I, I, I tend to think that uh, I'm racist. I know in my sub... Uh, I detect racism occasionally in my own actions uh, while I say I'm not a racist. I think that's fairly common that most of us down there somewhere... Uh, are racist. Does anybody agree with me on that at all? I, I disagree with you. Yeah. I, I disagree with you. I think you have preferences. Yeah. I, I think the. No. I think the. If you have. If you. If you. Op, if you operate under a system of universal norms. Yeah. Um, then you respect somebody. And there's going to be racism because there are human beings around. There, the question is whether uh, whether it's aberrant behavior or whether it's and whether it's pervasive or not. But the the, the operating universal norm is respect. And that's not obvious here in our relations. Then the, then you, then you have a personality defect. Yeah. Well, America has a personality defect. No, 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 no. Yes. The, we are a nation of individuals. You deal with your issue, and America is a broad sense. If we all deal with the issues as individuals, we're fine. Okay. One quick question. History right now has lost respect for each other, regardless of race, creed, or anything else. Just look at the evening news. I, I don't look at the news. <laughs> <laughs> The news is uh, actually I would recommend a book besides mine, and um, it's it's called uh, "Amusing uh, Yourself to Death," and it's about what television has done to this society. It was written in 1985 by a guy named Noel Postman, and it's son, and it's always in print. And his son just wrote uh, the introduction to the new book. Uh, which is uh, bringing it from the television to the internet in terms of what it's done to our society. One, one fast question, because we'll, we'll finish at seven. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to say, I mean, we're missing, but I think 
talk about, um, I was just in Mississippi a couple of weeks ago, and uh, in Magnolia, Mississippi. Uh, uh, my wife is from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Uh, attended an Undoing Racism workshop. Uh, this is my third time I've been through it. it. Takes about three times for me to get it. But, um, uh, you know, and I, 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 first of all, I want to compliment you on, on, on uh, the history that you gave and looking forward to reading your book. Uh, it's very enlightening. And, uh, but I think as, as, as uh, white and blacks, but whites in particular, if we understand the history as you have uh, given us a peek into and, and really get into the history of racism and how has it come to be what it is in this, uh, in this nation and the fact that it's, you know, it's race discrimination plus power. And as white people, we all have the power uh, and, and people of color do not. We need to, uh, and, and I would advise all of you, if you get a chance, uh, to take the undoing racism. It, it talks about the uh, internalized racial inferiority of people of color and the internalized racial superiority that there, there are enough There are enough successes in the black community. There's a huge black elite that has uh, succeeded in every aspect of American life. So, of course. Um, yeah, so I, I think that in terms of the barriers, uh, Th those barriers don't exist. There are discriminatory things, but uh, there aren't the obstacles that you, that you say. There's plenty of opportunity out there. Let's thank Gene very much for his talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Sure, sure, sure. Sign some books. Cousin. Oh my God! That's right. What are you doing here? <laughs> uh, well, fondly enough, uh, I live in Stanford now. So I happen to be in the library uh, for a meeting, and I see this name that I know. What are you up to now? Oh boy! Have you met my? You haven't met my wife. You're on, you're, you're on speaker. <laughs> Hiya, I'm Doug Friedenberg. My cousin. My cousin. Oh. 